In the apparatus here, we have a microwave transmitter on the left and a microwave transmitter on the right connected to a meter, which, will be which we will use to, to show the intensity of the detected microwaves. We've then set up uh, three metal plates, and these have been arranged to form a double slit, where the width of each slit is about three centimeters, which is approximately the same as the wavelength of this uh, microwave kit. If we take the transmitter and move it from side to side here, we see the signal intensity decrease and then increase again. And if we continue to move the transmitter, we'll see the intensity start to decrease again. So as we move it uh, from one side to the other, we're getting basically a series of maximum. If we go back again, we go from a minimum, you can see there going up to a maximum now. And then we continue to move, we go to a minimum, and then the needle comes back up, we get another maximum. Go to a minimum. And then as we continue to move, we'll get another maximum again. So as we're moving the transmitter, the receiver rather, uh, across there, we're getting a series of maxima and minima detected on the uh, microwave receiver. So what was happening there? Well, this diagram shows the kit that we had set up there. So we've got our microwave transmitter, source of microwaves, and when we have the double slit. Now what's happening is the microwaves travel from the transmitter. They are incident on this double slit. And what happens is the microwaves are diffracted at each of these slits. So you can imagine the microwaves being diffracted there and there. And of course, as they diffract, they spread out. And as they spread out, what they're going to do is they're going to overlap. And of course, as they overlap, they are superposing and we're going to get interference taking place. Basically, each of these slits is acting as a source of microwaves. Now, if you can imagine here at this central position, when we have the receiver in that position, we are going to detect a maximum here. Why is that? Microwaves are traveling to this position from each of these slits. Each of these slits is acting as a source of microwaves because microwaves are being diffracted from each of these slits onto the uh, receiver when it's located at this position. Now, if you think about it, the microwaves have to travel exactly the same distance from each of these slits to reach this point here where we've positioned our microwave receiver. Therefore, if the wave started in phase here, they will remain in phase at this position here and they will overlap in phase. We will have what we call constructive interference taking place and we will have a maximum produced. So just to recap here, when the microwave receiver is in this position at the middle, what's happening is microwaves are diffracted at each slit, they superpose and at this central position here, microwaves from each slit have traveled the same distance, they arrive in phase, constructive interference takes place, and we produce a maximum. Now then, when microwaves arrive at this position, we will get another maximum of intensity. Why is that? Well, can you see here, the, the microwaves here from this uh, top slit actually have to travel further uh, than they do from this bottom slit here. If we call this path one and this path two, Path one is longer than path two. Microwaves from the top slit are having to travel a little bit further. If they have to travel one whole wavelength further, that means they will arrive in phase again with the microwaves taking the second path from the bottom slit. And that means again, they will arrive in phase, constructive interference will take place again. And uh, once again, we will have a maximum produced. When we come to this bottom position here, again, we will have another maximum. Why are we getting a maximum produced in that position? Well, this time the microwaves from the top slit have to travel even further uh, relative to the microwaves from the bottom slit. This time what we can call the path difference, which is the difference in these two distances here, will actually be two whole wavelengths, meaning that once again the waves will arrive in phase at this position here, producing a maximum. So what have we got here? At this posi position in the middle, path difference is zero wavelengths. Okay, they both travel the same distance. Here, the path difference is one wavelength, and here, the path difference is two wavelengths. Of course, we'll have the same pattern on the other side. This time, the microwaves from the bottom slit are traveling further. So again, here, the path difference is one wavelength, and here, the path difference is two wavelengths. 
At each of these positions, we will have a maximum of intensity of microwaves detected simply due to constructive interference between the light arriving or the microwaves arriving from each of these slits. What about in this position here then halfway between the maxima? Well this position we're going to have a minimum and the reason for that is here again the microwaves from the top slit have had to travel a little bit further than the microwaves from the bottom slit and in actual fact in this case they'll have to travel half a wavelength further. Now if they start in phase here then at these two slits if the light uh, microwaves from the top slit travels half a wavelength further that will put it in antiphase with the microwaves arriving from the bottom slit and if you like then a wave crest overlaps with a wave trough they cancel out destructive interference and a minimum is produced okay so we'll just summarize what we said there then so basically explaining that pattern the microwaves are diffracted at the slits the microwaves from each slit will then superpose as they overlap if the path difference from each slit is a whole number of wavelengths, then the microwaves from each slit will arrive in phase, leading to constructive interference and a maximum of intensity being produced. Conversely, we know that at the minima, the path difference will equal n plus a half in brackets times the wavelength. In other words, if n was zero, n is an integer, if n was zero, the path difference would be half a wavelength, that would be the first minimum one and a half wavelengths at the second minimum, two and a half wavelengths at the third minimum, and so on. If that's the case, the microwaves will arrive in antiphase, and that means destructive interference is going to take place, and obviously that cancellation then will lead to a minimum of intensity. We can also demonstrate two-source interference using visible light if we use a laser and a double slit. Now obviously here for light, these slits need to be really narrow in order to cause the light to actually diffract. So the, typically here we might use a, a slit separation of uh, maybe quarter of a millimeter, something of that order. So that distance there is what we would call the slit separation. Give the symbol S and that might be a quarter of a millimeter. And on the screen the, 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 we'd have a screen here, here, so the laser light is being diffracted as it passes through each slit. It's being then allowed to fall onto a screen. Typically, the distance there between the slits and the screen is the symbol D. That wants to be large, maybe of the order sort of around about two meters, probably somewhere between one and a half to ten meters, maybe, um, in order to get uh, a really clear two source pattern. Now, when we perform that experiment, and uh, we look at the screen using a laser. So if we're using a, a laser, laser gives monochromatic light. So we've got a red laser here. And what we produce is a series of fringes, what we call fringes, light and dark fringes here, which certainly at the center of the pattern at least will be equally spaced. And we get these equally spaced uh, light and dark fringes. Again, these are due to superposition and to constructive and destructive interference. So basically here, if you like, we've got the center always in the middle, we're gonna have a central maximum because light from each uh, slit will have traveled exactly the same distance. So it will arrive in phase on the screen and we will produce a maximum. And here then we've got, if you like, the first subsidiary maximum when light from one of the slits has traveled one wavelength further and that puts it in phase again. And once again, we get constructive interference. At the minima here, you're getting destructive interference at the first minimum here light from one slit has traveled half a wavelength further and we're getting destructive interference. Now obviously the wavelength of visible light very very small you know for red light somewhere maybe in the region of 700 nanometers so there's no way you're going to be measuring the path difference here to this first uh, subsidiary maximum it's too small. However provided the slit separation is much smaller than the slit screen distance which it obviously is going to be here uh, for light uh, this distance here two meters way bigger than 0.25 meters uh, 0.25 millimeters if that is the case we can use uh, Young's formula so the Young slit formula is W equals lambda D over S where D is the fringe separation in meters so that's the spacing of the fringes on the screen S is the slit separation in meters, 
D is the distance from the slits to the screen, and lambda is the wavelength in meters. Now we don't need to derive that formula, we do need to use it. Uh, what we also do need to appreciate is that won't work for all two source superposition patterns. It will only work where this distance here between the slits and the screen is far greater uh, than the slit separation, which obviously it is here. So let's imagine I wanted to use the pattern we've produced here to determine the wavelength of visible light. How could I do it? If I want to work out the wavelength, I can rearrange this formula. So wavelength here will equal the fringe separation multiplied by the slit separation divided by the slit screen distance. Now, obviously I can measure this distance with the ruler between my double slit and screen. So in this case, I'll take it to be exactly two meters. Let's say that's been measured to two meters to the nearest centimeter, so 2.00 meters. And let's say we know this, we've measured that accurately as 0.25 of a millimeter. So we look at our screen and what we would do to get the fringe spacing, because these are obviously only a few millimeters apart, we wouldn't just measure from one fringe to the next, we'd measure over a range of fringes. So what I would do is measure that distance there. Now on this particular pattern, that distance was actually found to be 32 millimeters. So what have we got there? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six uh, fringe spacing. So the average fringe spacing here, W, would be 32 divided by six. Now we can work that out and we would get 5.33 millimeters. So if we want to work out the wavelength, what have we got? Well, there's the calculation, 5.33 times 10 to the minus th three multiplied by 0.25 times 10 to the minus three over two. So 670 nanometers to two significant figures. Not surprising considering the color of the laser here, red laser, so we know it's gonna to be towards the 700 nanometer end of the visible spectrum. Now that experiment works very well with laser light for two reasons. Laser light is very intense. Remember, these slits are really narrow, so they're not, allow, not going to allow much light through. So we want a very intense beam of light if we're going to have a high enough intensity on the screen to be able to see these fringes. The other advantage of laser light is it is coherent. Now, if we're going to see a clear and stable uh, two-source pattern, it is very important that our sources are coherent. What does that mean? Well, if two sources are going to be coherent, they must have the same frequency and a, a constant phase relationship, or if you like, any phase difference between the sources must be fixed. And that is what is meant by coherence. Laser light is coherent. Um, what is exactly does that mean, constant phase relationship? Well, for example, the light from one of these sources could be, let's say, a quarter of a, a period ahead of the other, provided it was always a quarter of a period ahead, and the phase difference between these two sources didn't shift. If it was just shifting gradually, you would see a gradual shift of these fringes as long as they moved along. And of course, if the phase difference between the two changed rapidly, perhaps because they've got different frequencies, then you wouldn't see these fringes will be moving around, moving across so quickly, or changing the position so quickly, you would not see a two source pattern. So you can be asked that, I mean, what are the conditions you need here? Well, you need a coherent light source. Um, what does that mean? Well, the, 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 two, the, source, uh, the two sources must have the same frequency, a constant phase relationship here, key. What about if you didn't have a laser, if you just had a normal, perhaps a filament lamp, just a normal a light source like that? Could you produce a two source pattern using that arrangement? Well, the problem here is that this light source, it wouldn't be coherent. If you've got a filament lamp, what it's doing is it's emitting bursts of radiation from different parts of the filament all the time. And so, you know, the, the, the phase relationship here if, 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 if light arriving at this slit is coming from one part of the film, light here from a different part, it's not going to be coherent. So what you would do here, if you've got this situation, if you put a single slit here in front of the double slit, that would be there to ensure the light arriving at the double slit was coherent. Now, why does that make the light coherent? What happens is light passes here to the, to the first slit and then diffracts, and then it arrives at the second slit 
Now, because the light arriving at each of the second slits has come from the first slit, it's basically the same light arriving at each of these slits, and of course it's got to be coherent with itself. So that ensures the light arriving at the sec uh, second pair, of, this second here pair of slits is coherent, uh, and then of course it can overlap, and you can get uh, superposition uh, taking place and an interference pattern. So, if you ever get asked that here, what is the purpose of the single slit? Well, if you haven't got a laser there. The single slit is simply to ensure that the light arriving at the double slit is coherent. So you get a stable two source pattern. Even with that arrangement, it will be difficult here because of course this light usually is gonna be much less intense. Whereas the laser is emitting the light in a narrow beam, tightly focused beam, high intensity. Here, the problem will be that particularly if this screen is two meters away, um, the intensity of the light here will be quite low. Uh, and so you may not see very much. Just as a finishing point, as an aside, when you look at the, the uh, two source pattern here with visible light here with the laser, you've obviously got the light and dark fringes here. What you may notice in this region is the pattern appears to disappear and then the fringes kind of come back again. And we get now what's actually happening here is the single slit diffraction pattern is moderating. Um, the two source patterns. So if you remember the single slit diffraction pattern, it looks something a bit like that with this very central, uh, very intense central maximum, and then much, much less intense subsidiary maxima of, of half the width of the central one. Now, basically this two source pattern is being moderated by that single slit diffraction pattern because basically um, before the light can overlap on this screen and, and, and interference can take place, light must be diffracted into those positions on the screen from each of the single slits. Now in this position here, and these two slits which of course are very, very close together, uh, basically no light really is being diffracted into that position of the screen from either of the single slits here because it's at this point of the single slit diffraction pattern. And that's why we're, we're getting nothing there, we're getting no two source pattern because no light is actually arriving in that position from either of the slits. No light is being diffracted into either of those positions there from each of the slits. And then what basically is happening is your two source pattern is kind of existing in the envelope here of this uh, single slit diffraction pattern. So, so I've not drawn that too well, but you get the idea here. Basically, you're going to get uh, this central fringe here. And it's going to have an intensity here, with the light diffracted into that position from each of the each of the uh, each of the double slits here, each of these slits, and then we're going to have these these um, fringes are going to become less intense until they disappear here completely. So. There you go, really. I don't worry about that too much, but if you were wondering why the fringes here get less bright, disappear, and then appear to come back with a slightly higher intensity, that's the reason.